Hello and welcome to the Tech Lab. Today I'm joined by Nihal Shah for episode six. Nihal has over 20 years of experience building high performing teams. He's recently started at Zola, where he's the head of engineering, and he's previously led and scaled engineering functions for Berlin giants like Zolando, Babel, and McMacula. Today we'll discuss his journey into tech, some of the values and lessons he's learned, and get into the core discussion, which is going to be deconstructing the biases in the industry from stereotypes of engineers to collaboration across the wider company to diversity in the wider teams. At Source Talks, our mission is very simple. It's to provide value by allowing you to hear from these tech leaders in a more intimate setting just where they just can discuss key challenges in their companies, trends in the market and in the industry at the moment. And ultimately, we're aiming to deliver content that everyone can learn from and offer you sort of these practical insights that you could apply to your own business context. Without further ado, let's get into it. I'm really excited for today's episode. Hello, Niha. Welcome. Uh, how are you doing today? Uh, thanks for having me. I'm doing well. Nice one. Well, let's get into the discussion a bit more. Um, could you just give us a brief intro on yourself and, and tell us a bit more about your role at the moment? Sure, sure. I'm uh, I'm uh, Nihal. I'm uh, originally from the US, uh, but now I've been in Berlin for the past eight years. I currently work as uh, head of software engineering at Solar, a uh, um, a renewable energy energy company that is uh, using solar energy to fight climate change. Amazing. And uh, could, could you give us a bit about your sort of, the sort of mission at Zolar and what made you want to join? Um, yeah, so uh, Zolar is, uh, I think our vision is a, a green world for everyone. And essentially, um, the the way we do that is by installing uh, PV systems on, on homes throughout throughout Germany. Germany is our, our market right now. Uh, PV, if you don't know what PV stands for, it stands for photo, photovoltaic. Um, so essentially, it's it means uh, it's a system that basically turns solar energy into electricity. Okay, nice one. I think that's a lesson for a few people because I didn't know, I didn't know what that stood, that stood for. Um, and what are some of the kind of challenges you're you're facing right now? Because you're 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 in your how many months have you been working there? Uh, I just started, so uh, it's been less than two months. I started back in December first. Lovely. And what are some of the challenges you're facing? Um, so I guess aside from the usual OKR madness, um, you know, I think we're, 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 I think we're trying to scale the business to meet the challenges and demands of, of, uh, of our customers. So, you know, we have a lot of customers and, uh, uh that, you know, the demand server goes up and down based on, you know, energy prices, uh, based on, you know, what war, war is, is happening right now. Um, and, and also, you know, the government subsidies. So if com the government is subsidizing solar energy, there's obviously going to be more demand for for solar energy and pv systems um i think specifically for us uh and and my teams uh i think we're the biggest challenge is uh, uh, just building getting the right people in building the right teams uh and and uh and and getting uh the i think the right mindset in the teams to uh to meet the the ever-changing you know demands of the business um and i and i and i i think it you know, with some with a uh, with a uh, with an industry that's complex as solar energy, um, the PV systems themselves are fairly complex. Uh, there's a lot of coordination that 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 uh, comes into play in terms of lo you know, the logistics of getting the parts there uh, to the site, to the construction site, to getting the installers there, um, getting them equipped with the right information at the right time, and so there's a lot of complexity inherently in the product and um, making uh, getting people to row in the right direction so that we make this uh, flow easy and accessible for everyone. I think that's a big challenge for us, but I think that's why that's the business that we're in. Yeah. And I'm sure that's what they, they hired you to get involved with, right? Well, could you, could you tell us a bit more about, you said the German uh, government's kind of sort of subsidizing uh, solar energy businesses and things like this. Is this, is this fairly, a fairly new concept or has it been around for a while? It's been around for a while. I think uh, they're actually talking about cutting the subsidies recently. Um, and, and I mean, not just for solar energy, but uh, uh, for a lot of other things. I think there was a, a protest of uh, um, with regard to, I think, farm subsidies that uh, incited a, a big protest in Berlin a, a week ago where um, a bunch of, tractors, bunch of uh, farmers and tractors uh, uh, took over Berlin, or at least parts of Berlin for, for, for a day or so. So. Uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's it's about I think government commitment 
and if uh, if there, if there's commitment from the government, uh, then you see a lot of that 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 adds like thing it's positive pressure to make things change. And when you don't have that, it of course it kind of disappears. Oh wow! I did. I, I think I saw something similar to that. Is um, because I thought it was in France because you know France, the 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 Paris capital has a lot of similar things. I I saw like tractors like spraying things at the government buildings. Is that was that in Berlin? It might have been. Yeah, there was there was also a, um, a a protest in Berlin as well. Oh wow! Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> so very interesting. Can can you tell me like a bit more about the the first two months that that you're in Zola, just for sort of our audience? Like, what's the sort of what's the sort of dynamic when you when you join a company like this that that is growing so quickly? It's obviously a very popular industry right now. Like, how have you found it? Um, I mean, I think so far uh, I, I've been really. Uh, I'm pleasantly surprised by the colleagues I've met at Solar. So I think everyone is really passionate about climate change, uh, really passionate about having a positive impact on the on the planet. Uh, and I think the, over, the, the, the there's a culture of 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 uh, we we're one team. We work together, and 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 we're trying to do something really positive for 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 the planet. And uh, you know. It, I think that's that's something you don't see very often. You know, like in in a lot of companies, there's often a lot of infighting or um, you know territorial disputes. Where I think everyone here, um, from my experience, has been uh, quite helpful and and really friendly. Sorry, that is cool that everyone. I guess that's because everyone's sort of aligned to the same goal, right? So yeah. everyone's looking in the same direction, like you mentioned. This is, yeah. and this is my uh, this is my favorite question as well, and I love to ask this to all our guests in terms of your sort of journey into uh, the tech industry from sort of the moment software captured your heart to where you are now uh could you tell us a little about about where you got how you got here today in your journey sure um that's that's a really long story and and, and not because i'm I'm pretty old but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll start with my first uh i guess for foray into computers um so when i was around seven years old um i my parents got me um so you you might remember the the Commodore sixty four was a pre- pretty popular computer system in the in the eighties. Um, we we had the the lower price point cousin of that the the VIC twenty, um, and uh, my parents got it for me um, uh, as as sort of a I guess for for games but also for education. So of course I had a few games. All of them were math games, uh, but it, it was it was a it was a sort of an a very complex toy. It was basically like a video game, um, but with an educational component to it. So, uh, um, but and it had these little cartridges. So you had you had these um, you know little cartridges with all these different games on them, and you plug them in, and then you play the game. Um, but then I discovered that if you don't plug the cartridge in, um, you get a command line interface. Uh, so the computer is just you know standalone, and uh, when you when you turn it on with a cartridge, you get this command line interface, and it's and it actually turns out to be a Turned out to be a basic interface. So basic, if you don't know what basic is, it's a it's a very simple programming language. It's taught to school children because it's very easy to grasp. It has a lot of very easy to grasp uh, terminology and in, in, in idioms, and um, uh, and it was sort of my first foray into computers. So um, I, I wrote my first program. I remember my first program. Um, it was and I can recite it to you right now. It was a ten print hello. 20 and you know the the number is the prog- program line number so it would execute these things by the order of the number so 10 uh print hello 20 go to 10 run and so like you, wow. you know, we run that and it would print hello down the screen and it would just keep doing that until you halted the program and that was like my, my and I, you know seven year old me was like oh my god i did something oh that's so cool <laughs> So uh, yeah, it was uh, that was like my first uh, foray into computers, uh, and then of course you know my my brother got me like a a, a little book of uh, basic programs, and um, th- so this computer didn't have any storage medium, it, it, you couldn't save anything, so like I would just spend the whole day uh, typing a program, and then the program you know, if you run it it would be a little game, if you if I, I typed everything correctly it would be a little game, and I would play the game, and then. Uh, and then my mom would call me for dinner and I'll turn the program, turn the computer off and then I'd come back the next day and then type everything again and play. If I typed everything correctly, it would be the little game and I'll play the game. And then so um, I, I, ha- I had a lot of practice typing programs back then. Um, and I think that was like that, that taught me a lot about how like programs would work and about, you know, basic, 
like fundamentals about programming, like if then statements and about like go, you know, like redirection and, you know, uh, subroutines and stuff like that. So, um, and then I guess later on, so I, I was always good with computers. And then, uh, uh, for example, um, you know, I was probably like a computer pro program, uh, computer, uh, uh, club in in uh, middle school where we uh, you know we would learn about different things aspects of computers and that was my first introduction to the internet and the internet was this was before mosaic which was like the one the the first you know web browser that ever existed this was a precursor to netscape which was the precursor to basically every web browser that exists today um so this was even before that this was basically the command line you type telnet you'd go you'd you would uh, uh, telephone into this uh, central machine, and uh, that was the internet back then. You had bulletin boards, you had email, everything was green screen, depending on the computer that you had, uh, and it was very basic. And that was my first exposure to the internet. And, uh, you know, I think from there, like, um, I, in, I, I remember my first exposure to Mosaic, a friend of mine uh was uh showed it to me and I, and I was completely blown away like oh my god i could click on a picture and it would take me to another page oh my god it blew my mind um and so like from there on um i i um you know i i, I had a lot of um different uh exposures to different aspects of, of computers and then finally um you know it was a late so when i went to university um I uh, ended up getting my bachelor's in psychology. So uh, I, I'm kind of a nerd at heart. I have a lot of interests. And at the time, I had a lot of interest in how people work. Uh, mm -hmm. for me, so for me, I, a focal point of, uh, for me was psychology at the time when I got my bachelor's. And in fact, I was working at a mental mental hospital for a little while. Uh, when my father, um, in the late 90s, you may remember there was this tech bubble. Before the bur bubble burst, people were making money hand over fist. Uh, especially in Silicon Valley. And my father saw this and was completely outraged that I wasn't taking advantage of this, <laughs> of this windfall. Uh, so, um, so he kept, uh, he kept uh, trying to convince me, to, you know, you're, you're good with computers. Why aren't you doing that? And so finally he wore me down. I uh, ended up uh, going back to school, getting my master's in information technology. And uh, um, in, uh, at, in grad school, in one of my classes, I met a colleague who, who had a colleague who was starting a, a little consulting company. That was my first job. Uh, from there, uh, 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 the rest is history. So I, I, I've uh, had um, uh, I've had experiences uh, working on projects in different technologies. I think back then, uh, uh, going back to basic, I actually did a project in Visual Basic. That was one of my first uh one of my first projects uh but through the years i've worked on projects in java and php and uh scala node.js javascript uh with i, I worked on uh, jquery before it was uh, a 1.0 so like early versions of it uh and it was uh like uh, for me i think it was just always about like doing something cool using technology and using computers yeah. something really interesting and of course you know uh, about 15 years ago i um, I, I was given an opportunity to lead a team, uh, and then from there on out, I've been leading teams, and then teams of teams, and now departments. Uh, so, uh, for me, it's it, it, it's been an, actually an opportunity to really tie in my psychology background into technology and kind of marry those two, because managing is really about psychology and about trying to figure out how to you, how how people work to in order to make sure that the systems work um and so uh the the sort of uh the how should i show up this um um the uh the psychology aspect of trying to understand how people work and uh and and knowing that actually people are actually different from machines people actually have a, their own different motivations and their own you know, like you, you tell a machine to do something, it does that. You tell a human to do something and it'll, it, it'll either do that. There's a percentage chance that it'll do, they'll do just that. There's a percentage chance that they'll do the complete opposite. I mean, I have, I have a toddler, so I know that's, that's part of my world right now. Uh, <laughs> I, there's a high, percent, high percentage chance that my toddler will do the exact opposite of what I tell him. So it's, uh, it's, you know, like humans are, 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 you know, uh, work, I guess, on their own programming language, and we still haven't figured out that what that language is.
That's so amazing. I love I love that. And I, you'd be, I mean, I'm not maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but there's so many like tech leaders like yourself that when I ask that question, they're like, well, when I was five years old, six years old, seven years old, like I got my hands on like the first computer and things. And it's, it, it's really inspirational. And, it, and it, I guess that's where every sort of journey starts, right? With with your children at the moment, Nihal, do you, do you, when do you plan on getting them involved in, in sort of like tech and things? Is that, is that sort of like, is there an agenda there? Like what's, what's your sort of mission with, with them? Um, I mean, we have fights about this because I want to start them as soon as possible. Mm. Uh, but then uh, my wife uh, thinks that it t- may make them crazy. Uh, uh, <laughs> screen time, the, you know, that, yeah. the, that, that was a big learning for me, that screen time. Uh, sometimes you have to limit screen time because uh, uh, it's not always good for uh, these young children. So, uh, but I, I think I'm, you know, I started, uh, you know, my my journey when I was around seven. And I, I think maybe that's a good good time. I, I, I mean, I see kids that age, you know, with their own iPhones, you know, so I think there's there's probably a, a certain age where it's probably okay to start them out. And so I think my, I think my feeling is let, let's start them out as soon as possible, as as safe as possible. Um, and, and, uh, and I think, you know, that that that's going to be part of their lives growing up and, and I'd rather they be exposed to that sooner rather than later. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point that you make that that is like the future, right? Like that's what everyone's be doing. I guess it's how how you interpret the screen and how you're actually using the screen, right? Because like you said, there's there's kids with their own Instagram and things. I see them like ten years old just scrolling through like monotonous videos, and you're like, that's that's definitely not going to help. But if they're yeah. more programmed towards maybe tech uh, learning or shapes or colors, these these kind of things or language, even that I'm I'm sure that would be cool. What um out of interest, so you started off your most of your work in, in, in America and in like the States and things, um and in New York, right? When what when did you move when did you make the move to uh Berlin? Uh uh about eight years ago. Um I it, it's interesting. I was uh, sitting on the couch with my wife in New York. Um actually I think we we're in Jersey City at the time. And uh, we were just thinking, okay, what what else is out there? We've been, I'd been there for about seven years. She had been there for about, I think, 15 years. And, um, you know, we just thought, like, okay, well, you know, if we want to raise a family, do we want to do that here? Do we want to do it elsewhere? And uh, I was actually um, connected with someone uh, on LinkedIn uh, at the time. And uh, they started talking about Zalando in Berlin. And, uh, you know, being from the U.S., uh, my first question to her was, what's Zalando? Because... Uh, uh, Zalando is completely unknown in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, and are you living in Berlin? And you know, she said, "Yeah, I'm, I'm in Berlin. Uh, Berlin's a great city, better than New York. Zalando's a great company. Um, you should definitely apply." So that's uh, so I applied, um, had some really great conversations, uh, received an offer, and my wife and I we packed uh, four suitcases, sold everything else we had, came to Berlin in the middle of January. Um, uh, by the way, <laughs> when <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, eight years later, we're still here. We have two kids. Um, we, we, we really love Berlin. Amazing. And what, what's some of the contrasts like from, from people maybe listening from, from America, et cetera, maybe thinking about a move to Europe, <laughs> um, yeah. what's, what's sort of like your opinion on, on Berlin versus somewhere like the, the States or like New York, I think Washington or Chicago, some places like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely miss the food, like, uh, like the food in Chicago or New York, uh, just, uh, I, I miss it every day. I mean, there's, there's good food every day. Uh, not, not as, I mean, nothing compares to, to, to America for food sometimes. Um, however, on the other hand, uh, I think healthcare is, is really nice here. So, um, it's, it's much more structured and organized um uh and and uh like uh you know like we've had hospital visits where we never saw a bill and uh that's mm-hmm. that that doesn't happen in the u.s you you uh if you go to the hospital for anything or you see a doctor for anything you're going to get a bill like it, whether it's for ten thousand or ten dollars or ten thousand dollars you're going to get a you're going to get a bill yeah i mean if you walk across the road the wrong way you're going to get a bill you know i mean <laughs> um that's cool, and it, like you, like you say, you have your family, right? So the healthcare is so so important. What yeah. to, in, in terms of like values and things, you know, you talk about Zalando, and also um, I believe you worked at like Mackler as well. Like, 
and, and Babel, for example, where you led teams and, and been a director. What's some of the values that you've picked up and that you learned and really like keep sort of core to your to your to yourself going forward? Like, what what are some of the values that you picked up? Um, so I think going back to my psychology background, um, it's it's always it's all about the people. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it's people that are that are making the software, or making things go, and um, you know, it's important to make sure that they feel empowered and they, um, you know, feel like they are doing the best that they can, um, and 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 uh, and you know, bringing their best selves into into uh, their everyday work. Um, the the other thing that I think is really important to me is teams. Uh, the the concept of of having a good team. Uh, um, you know, it, it's it's for me uh, having a stable, long lived uh, team with a common mission is really important. I mean, going back to common mission of 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 Zolar, you know, like you know when you have a common mission that really sort of aligns everyone and everyone's uh, thinking towards that common goal. And I think when you have uh, you know people that are you know that are committed to the team, committed to the the team's mission. Um, you can do do a lot of great things with that. Mm -hmm. and, and so, the part of my career, or a, a big focus of my career over the past few years, is let's build. Let, how do you build teams? How do you build a good, high performing team? Obviously, part of that is the people and getting the right people, and the but it's also about building the right mindsets, um, and and building the right culture so that the the team. Um, you know, feels empowered, but has a sense of accountability towards that common mission. And I think if you have that, then, you know, people, especially people that come from different backgrounds um, and different functions, like, you know, if you have like uh, engineers working with designers and product managers and QA and et cetera, et cetera, working together as a, as, as a, as a team, they forget that they're designers. They forget that they're engineers. They forget that they're product managers. They just, they're more, they're just people that are really, uh, trying to achieve something big, and and I think when you have that, when you achieve that, that's really something special. Amazing, amazing, and and I think we're going to talk about some of these nuances across teams and uh, across like different departments as well. And and it'd be good, I guess, that's a good way to get into our core discussion, sort of on first of all, like the sort of perception of of the tech uh, industry and and engineers in general, and that sort of stereotype. Um, which we wanted to discuss today. What's your sort of? How do you perceive like the current images of engineers? Near how like, what what's your what what do you think the stereotypes are from out from outside and 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 how does that sort of differ from from your from your view? Um, so I think the the prevailing stereotype is that software the software engineer is is yeah, first of all male, um, second of all young. Uh, and third, usually Caucasian, sometimes Indian, uh, and and usually wearing a hoodie or of some type. Uh, I and and that's to me like I mean I think that's something that's that's uh, uh, perpetrated by you know popular media or, or and and, yeah. and and maybe by the industry itself. Like you you see like that 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 archetype played out in you know company events and conferences and stuff. So you, it, it it does exist um, and it's there, but. Uh, um, the the thing that um, I think is important to me is to go back to this, to this idea of people and that um, you know software engineers are people and people come in different sizes and shapes and colors and genders and to me it's about I think it's important to remind ourselves that um, you know that that uh, you know the stereotype is a stereotype but we need to de deconstruct that and to mm -hmm. remind ourselves that these are people in the end. That are you know it's they're not a, a certain class of people or a different class of people. They're actually people like you and me, like we're all people. And I, and I think mm -hmm. if we can understand that and and remind ourselves of that, uh, I think uh, it I think it makes the whole um, work of engineering in general much much more healthy or much yeah. healthier. Yeah, for sure. And and the fact that they make up like a large percentage of so many companies, right? Um, Absolutely. Also, I noticed you're not wearing a hoodie today, so that's uh, that's that's a good start. <laughs> um, you're talking okay. about like de deconstructing those sort of stereotypes and things. Um, can you share some experiences or like your your own strategies, for example, where maybe maybe in your current role or in, in the previous role, for example, that, that you've employed these sort of strategies to counteract these kind of stereotypes? Sure, sure. Um, so I think a big 
big aspect of that is employer branding. So telling telling the right story. Um, I like in past companies, um, I really pushed on the idea that uh, let let the engineers tell their own stories and also show that you know engineers do come in different shapes and sizes and colors and genders, etc. That uh, um, you know we don't have to you know uh, uh, you know have the same uh, image out there all the time. We can present a different image, and if you present a different image, uh, the people that that encourages people who uh, who are of a different image uh, to become interested and to um, uh, you know follow a, a path uh, you know either in that direction or even towards your company. And I think that's that's a, a really big aspect of that. Um, when I was at Babel, we we really pushed on this and we really pushed on the idea of like of having engineers really tell their own story. You know, we had videos and we had a lot of content to really push the idea that you know it, you know it, it is about people. You know, and people if people telling their stories. And yes, they're engineers, but you know that that's what they do. That's not who they are. Um, and uh, I think the other aspect I think is just hiring. You know, like building the right team, building, uh, you know, like building the right um, sort of diversity in your team, so that um, that sort of re reflects uh, how uh, a team should be. Um, you know, if you if you have you know more women in your team, if you have more people from different continents on your team. And you, and you show that that actually encourages the potential candidate uh, rather than discourages them because uh, they see themselves in the team. They see other people in the team that have similar experiences to them. And that, that I think is a very uh, encouraging thing for people because they can, uh, they can draw from the same experiences and draw strength from those experiences. And I think that's that bringing strength into any kind of relationship uh, strengthens that relationship and strengthens the team around it. Absolutely. And I think that goes to show with Babel, especially, I mean, having worked like nearly four years in Berlin myself, um, Babel is notably has a lot of women engineering managers, which you do not see at a lot of lot of companies. Um, and, I, and I guess it's down to like what you were saying there, right? How, how they sort of brand themselves as employers, the way they sort of tell, tell their story. Um, yeah. And I guess it's so important, like you said, to create this like sort of comfortable environment. I remember when I first got into hiring freelancers, the reason I loved it so much because it was like a, a comfortable environment where like when you spoke to them and sort of qualified them for a role and stuff, and, then, and this obviously used to be the day before remote interviews and things like this, like I remember they would turn up in like toe shoes, like uh, like vests, like, like board shorts, you know, like, because they were just like, They've been encouraged and empowered, and and I think that's what it, what it's all about, right? Um, yeah. Think about like the sort of opposite of this, I guess. Have you encountered any sort of resistance to that approach, um, and and how you sort of addressed it? Um, so I think I think the stereotype still still exists um, even to this day. Like um, I think, I mean, first of all, I think there's always um, organizational pressure to to hire quickly, to build a team quickly, to get things done. Um, so you, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to take a step back and go, okay, am I building the right team? Um, am I, am I making the right decisions here? Um, just because there's this organizational pressure to just keep going, going, going. Um, but I think there's also, I think, uh, the, the, the mindset of, uh, the, the, the proverbial and 10 X engineer that's in a hoodie still, I think still, still prevails. People still see that as, as like the, uh, penultimate, uh, you know, quality engineer that uh, like that's that's what makes a good engineer. Like the the size of the hoodie makes the engineer. Um, you know, <laughs> like no, like you can have good engineers uh, in different shapes and sizes. Like you, you know, like you. Can, I've I've worked with a lot of really great women engineers, a lot of great engineers from different countries and different continents, and that don't look like the stereotype. And uh, in in I think we just have to constantly challenge that viewpoint. That uh, that uh, especially a lot of a lot of leadership in companies and and a lot of stakeholders have in their heads about like what makes a good engineer. When we've spoken before, uh, Nihal, you talked about how you sort of you've empathized in in terms of the importance of engineers being thinkers uh, as well as doers. And I guess this goes back to the sort of stereotypes you were talking about between you know the different departments and um, <laughs> between, for example, like tech uh, and engineering and then the sort of all part of the business and the operations side or the, or the sales side for example 
can you sort of elaborate a bit on on your philosophy towards that and and those sort of company dynamics that you found? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I call it the the thinker doer manifesto. I it's a I mean it, it's a fancy name, but uh, uh, and 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 it I mean not to say that you know thinkers don't do or, or doers don't don't think, but the the idea is that. Um, uh, let me let me go. Let me tell you a story. So I, I um, you know, many years ago, I was uh, pulled into uh, a, a meeting about some project, and uh, um, and uh, when I got to the meeting, I, it turned out I was the only like tech person in the meeting, and the meeting was really about a project that I was learning about for the first time. But it turned out there was already an ongoing discussion for many weeks about it um, that involved you know various stakeholders and people on the business side. Um, and it seemed to me, or uh, at least the, the perception was that uh, 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 there was a lot of momentum behind this project. Um, everyone was really gung ho, and I was brought in to sort of you know talk about the feasibility and talk about the how, and and uh, and, and and basically show show the path forward. Uh, and the more they talked about, it, the more it sounded crazy and unfeasible and. Uh, I was put in a position to really give <laughs> give some bad news to a, a room full of people, uh, which was very uh, uh, uncomfortable and awkward for anyone to, or, uh, not, uh, uncomfortable and awkward position for anyone to be in. Um, so, uh, um, and, I, and, and I remember thinking after all that, like, I wish they had brought me in earlier, because if they had, I could then have steered them towards a better solution. Or more workable solution than than what they had thought, but uh, you know it just seemed to me like they had just they had, I was just there to kind of ch check the box and say yep cool let's do it, um, mm -hmm. and uh, w w and 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 I think that made it really a very tough conversation to have, um, and so they had just that feeling of like I wish they had brought me in earlier made me realize that there's this kind of separation and it's 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 a kind of it's an un, unseen or an unwritten separation between, you know, like two classes of people. And it, it is kind of a class system uh, in a lot of companies where you have, you know, a, a you know, set of people who are sort of the idea people who are, you know, trying to move, move the business forward in the best way they can, you know, and trying to find, you know, you know, find ways to really, you know, push the product or sell the product or sell the business in, in, in the way and increase revenue and, you know, reduce costs, what have, whatever to make the business healthier. And, and, and more profitable. And then you have like this other set of people that are there to um, kind of implement everything. So implement the ideas that they've come up with. And, uh, and uh, um, you know, they, they, and there's usually this divide because, uh, you know, there's so much conversation and, and so much, uh, uh, how should I put this? There's, uh, there's a different kind of language that's, that's spoken uh, amongst the idea people. And then the uh, and then the 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 people that are the doers uh, are the people that usually the tech people or the people that are kind of making things work, making things go, and uh, the the I, and I and the thing that I I found is that this there's this uh, this divide between these two people. I think because they're always they're speaking a different language often at times, um, you know, and and that's the, that's when I came up with the concept of the thinker doers. That there's these thinkers and they think sort of this thinking language, and then these doers are just speaking this doer language, and they don't know really how to talk to each other. And so you have this sort of proverbial wall, and they're constantly kind of talking through it or over it, um, rather than talking directly. And so uh, one of the things that I've always um, advocated for was breaking down this wall and having direct, you know, build, building a bridge, having direct conversation, and starting to speak the language of the other group. So, uh, you know, th having um, having uh, uh, you know thinkers really sort of into the conversation of of the doing part, and having doers really being brought earlier into the conversation that the thinkers are having. And so, once we have that, and once we're speaking the same language. Um, you know, then we can really, um, you know, together move the business forward. Um, and that's something that's been, like, I've seen that over and over in, in every company and, and on some level that I worked at, that there's this kind of unwritten or un, un, unspoken class system of, of people. Yeah, that's so interesting, the example you said at the start about them sort of bringing you in as sort of like the guy where you're like, hey, can we make this happen? Like, tick, like hoping that you'd sort of like, 
just t- give them the technical yes we can we can do it and then they'd always celebrate like if like you said they if they actually thought of you like you said earlier like as a as a as a person not just some sort of like tech robot you know um then they would have been able to include you from the start to come up with actual solutions and like a solution driven approach rather than you know you just basically saying no this is not going to work <laughs> um and I guess that even further like makes and then it further makes more of a divide right after that um yeah it's it's, it's, it's mad do you, do you see that that changing a lot like how what sort of problems does it cause when tech sort of like shielded off from from the rest of the rest of the company um well I wouldn't call it shielding because uh, I don't you know I think when something goes goes wrong uh, there's very little shielding happening um but I think what's happening is that I think tech doesn't always have an equal voice. Um, you know, you have, um, you know, you have the sort of the visionary people that are steering the ship and then you have, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the people in the galleys that are like trying to make sure that everything works. Um, and at the end of the day, um, th- I think that those people don't really have a voice. Um, you know, oftentimes uh, uh, what's happening is that um, tech is really, um, you know, uh, put in a position of really reacting to the rest of the business rather than really driving the business. And, uh, um, and, and I think that really, you know, that, that creates a lot of tension. Yeah. And, and you mentioned before like this, this, this idea of, uh, the class system that you, that you mentioned, um, how does that sort of Im- impact like collaboration, for example, like when you're getting into these projects from, from the beginning, so what, what, how, what kind of steps as well can you take to, so a challenge that, that those divisions as well. Um, I think, like I said, I think you have to start speaking uh, the same language, and I, I think part of that is, um, I think as people in tech, we need to really understand the business that you're in. So you, you know, whatever business business that you're that the company is in, you really have to understand and speak the language of that business, and that means not just like okay, there's. You know, there, there's a language of technology uh, that we all know, but we also have to take the time to really understand the domain, really understand uh, like like what really drives a business. What are the key business key KPIs? What are the what are the things that really make the business run? Uh, and you know, what is the customer point of view? Uh, what is the stakeholder point of view? And if I think if you kind of you know, I, I, like I encourage people to take their tech hat off. And put on their, you know, their finance hat, or their stakeholder hat, or their marketing hat, uh, or their, or their, or their, um, or their sales hat, and and look at the world from, and look at the business from th- that point of view, because you'll see a completely different world and a completely different business than what you see in the past. And I mean, sadly, I mean, my experience is, is that, uh, you know, I think people in technology aren't encouraged enough to do that, and I've, I've worked with. Uh, engineers who had no idea what the business, what business we're in. Like they know that we need to put this checkbox here, and that uh, that that's because somebody told them to do do that or that it's important. But they have no idea what that checkbox does. Like they just know that it's there and that they've done everything they've done to make sure that it's there and it functions. But they don't understand like why why do we need a checkbox there? Well, like what is what is the business case for that, and why does how does that have any impact on our ability to you know. Gain revenue or gain market share or generate leads like, and uh, and I think there's a certain, uh, uh, I think a, a resistance from people outside of tech to really understand the language of tech. So and I, I've talked talked to many people um, uh, who who voiced uh, not even just uh, uh, resistance but almost fear like oh my god I don't like I don't understand I'm too stupid to understand <laughs> tech uh, like don't talk to me in that language I have no idea I'm too stupid. Um, and I, I think what's important is to remind them that, uh, again, you know, these are people too. This is not like some crazy foreign language. This is not alien, you know, alien technology. This is people built, this is technology built by people. Uh, and these people do, you know, they, you can converse with them. Um, and, and I think it's, it's important to remind them that, uh, or remind people outside of tech that tech isn't that scary. That at the end of the day, yeah. it is, there is a certain ability to access it, to access it, and to 
um, and even understand how it works on 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 an even high level. You can understand how it works, and I think if if you can change the conversation so that and mindsets so that you know people on the that are outside of tech, the the the, the thinkers, so to speak. Uh, if you understand, if they if they understand and have the mindset that they can understand how doing works, how how do you, how we actually get things done uh, on the technology side, and if you convince people uh, on the tech side or on the doing side that you you, you have an opportunity uh, to be part of the thinking conversation, and in fact your voice is really uh, um, important and necessary in that in those conversations and here's how to have those talk how to have those conversations and here's the language you need to speak i think if you if you can solve those two problems then i think you then you, i think you're you're on your way to really undoing this class system yeah it's it's really interesting and and i'm, I'm sure i mean what i want to say is that um well some of the best advice that i've ever got like being in sales as well and like sort of having these ideas people as, as as you talk as you talk about and having to converse with developers and tech leaders all the time the best advice i've ever got is just be honest and be and just hey, say hey that doesn't make sense to me right now can you please elaborate that in either layman's terms or something maybe give me a metaphor that i might understand and then i can go away do some research and come back to you and we can discuss it but it's not like that it's it's like you said it's like this like oh my god like i'll never i'll never it's like you're speaking like mandarin to them or something for the first time <laughs> Um, it's like you're absolutely right. It's like um, I think you have to learn, understand that you that you have something to teach and something to learn. And I think everyone, if everyone realizes that they have something to teach and something to learn, we 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 actually improve all, ourselves, all of ourselves. Like we we the, the net effect of that is actually a better team and and uh, a more conversant and I think happy team. Yeah, absolutely. And and sort of your background in, in psychology and also from leading t like several, if not dozens of teams uh, in in your in your career, I'm sure you're much better at being that person who sits on both both sides of that sort of proverbial wall that you're talking about. And you can converse with, you know, any stakeholder in the business, be it a customer, a CEO or like a, a junior developer. But how do you sort of encounter like how how does like your team deal deal with these kind of things? Maybe they they don't have as much uh, exposure to those sort of conversations, and uh, and maybe they don't have the same background as as yourself in like psychology and how to deal with certain people and things. Like how do you kind of address these biases when they when they pop up in in the team? Um, I mean, I think that's a good question. I, I think it's important to uh, I think just reiterate. Um, First of all, from pe for people that are outside of tech, to you know, to say that these these are people here, that 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 you know, software engineers are people too, um, that um, uh, um, that and, and I think it's important to give them opportunities to actually meet. Like it's important to, um, you know, give them, uh, you know, it's important to sort of push. Uh, engineers who aren't used to having conversations with stakeholders to actually talk to stakeholders um, or to get their answers, uh, questions answered uh, directly from a stakeholder than to sort of go through the chain. Um, and and that, I think to me, that's the most important aspect of it. Like direct communication is, is really key. Um, if you get people talking to each other, then going through, you know, tickets or through their managers or what have you, um, uh, I think you, you know, you, you cut away those biases, you know, it's like, uh, um, you know, if it, you know, a lot of the issues that we have with immigration, um, in, in Germany is really, um, or, or the resistance to immigration in Germany are in actually in towns that don't have, don't see a lot of immigrants because they don't, they don't know what it's, so for them, it's the scary thing that's, that's further away and they don't grasp it. And so they're more, more fearful of it. Than in towns where there are immigrants and they they see them in in their daily life and they interact with them and they realize these are people too, and they're not so bad and uh, and I think that's the same thing if you have like direct exposure and communication, um, you 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 kind of cut away the fear and the bias and and you see people as they are. Yeah, and I think people like myself and, and yourself who grew up, grown up in very like multicultural places as well like like capitals of, of countries um, like London, New York, etc., Washington, 
um, we probably take that for granted, right? That the this sort of fear that exists and and, and that metaphor you use is very very interesting. What sort of what sort of concepts or even like practices like in in business where I, I guess it could be like an all hands or something where maybe like a company wide one. What sort of practices have you found the best where tech people and and and, and the rest of the company can can mingle? Um, so hackathons is is one really great way to to encourage uh, collaboration, um, especially if you enforce the idea of people from different teams or departments working together. Uh, that works really well. Um, and I've seen that work really beautifully at at uh, at uh, like at Babel or Zalando, for example. Um, one thing that I think we need to do more of in tech is uh, evangelize, um, talk talk about tech more, about how it adds value to the business, how it drives the business. Um, uh, and and I I've seen that in in almost every company that I worked at that just tech is just really bad at sort of talking about itself and how you know mm. how what it does for the company um and, and and it's hard i think it's hard because you know we don't have in tech i think we don't have easy metrics you know like sales if you're a sales driven company it's quite easy like the number of sales more sales means more revenue you know it's 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 that's a very easy calculation whereas tech uh, you know like when it comes to software products um especially you know it, it, we're not you're not selling the product that like we're not building the product that you're selling uh, but tech is really sort of a driver or support function or or an, an enabler for the rest of the business um it's hard to quantify it's hard to measure like exactly what the net effect what the net impact uh tech has on it i mean you know it's there you know it costs a lot of money um but how do you sort of how do you measure and and, and show uh, in a tangible way like what what the positive impact tech has on the company. Um, so that that's a hard conversation, but I think we need to do it more. I think we need to um, talk about what we're delivering and, and how, and the positive things that we do more in tech. Um, uh, and, and, and I think what we need to do is uh, also, uh, we need to invite uh, um, uh, like other parts of the business into the conversation of tech. So really um, bringing stakeholders into, you know, conversations about, uh, how we do things, but also like, going back to teaching and learning. I think we again we have to learn, understand that we have something to learn and something to teach. So, um, you know, uh, one thing that we did well at at McMockler was we actually you know had these like knowledge sharing sessions where we brought people from different parts of the business into a discussion about what they do. So you know, what does a broker do? What's the daily life of a broker? What does it look like? And let's talk about that and, and get a bit greater understanding and a deeper understanding of that. Or like marketing, like what 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 is performance marketing and how did how does that impact the company? Um, you know, not not everyone knows, and you know, especially on the tech side, it, it's you know when we're actually building some of the tools that that support that, it's helpful to know that to understand like oh the the, the things that we're building actually do this, which do this, which actually. Uh, end up with you know with better conversion rates, which means more revenue for the company. Which means, you know, we all get a pizza party or whatever. It's uh, it's it's, uh, it's you know I think we need to sort of connect the dots a bit better. Yeah, and um, with with Zola, is that is that more like a sales driven company? Is it more of like a hardware driven company, or is it more sort of engineering driven? What's the what's the uh, balance? I think it's more. Sales driven. I think Solar is more sales driven as a company um, because that's uh, that. I mean, that's really is what started. It started out as a company that sells PV systems, um, and that's, uh, at heart, that's what it is. Um, uh, I think there's a big component of operations in it. So there's you know there's uh, because PV systems are complex, and there's a lot of coordination between uh, between the customers and our partners, and how to sort of coordinate all of these things so that. Um, you know, we get the PV systems installed correctly uh, in as short a time as possible. So that's, you know, that's, that, I think there's a, an operations aspect of that that I think is crucially important. And then I think tech is sort of a, a driver of all of that in that it supports all of these different, you know, functions and in, in, in a very important way. So it really drives sales, um, but it also drives uh, the, 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 the coordination aspect. And, and, and we have a lot of the workflow we build a lot of the workflow that actually helps coordinate and get these things working in as fast as fast as time as possible. Nice. And, and are you able to share any things like that you're working on, like sort of current current products or anything that obviously 
anything that's not under NDA or things like this? Is there any exciting things that, um, that Zola are doing at the moment this year? Um, uh, so this year, uh, you know, we're, we're really becoming more uh, partner led and we're, we have something that we have a concept where we're trying to basically become more of a, how should I call it a flywheel where we're trying to really um, build a business around um, improving the lives of our customers, giving them a better experience. And if they can have a better experience, then that sort of feeds into uh, the part, the partner experience. So the partners that actually install the systems in on the customer site, um, if they, if they have a better, if they have, a, if the customers have a better experience then the partners actually are able to draw in more customers and if they're able to draw in customers and we make this process better and scalable, we then can then uh, use that to then create a better customer experience with them. So like it, it sort of feeds into itself. And that's something that we're trying to build now is this sort of this ability to really scale on demand, uh, uh, this ability to really sort of feed into our customers and our partners to make this um, kind of a self uh, compounding system where we can really then uh, drive the growth of the expansion of uh, the installation of PV systems throughout Germany. No, it's really interesting and um, looks like it's a, it's a very bright future. And I know it's a, definitely a space with with a lot of investment uh, as, as well, um, especially speaking about some of your sort of competitors as well. There's, 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 there seems to be some one of the only industries that has a lot of investment at the, at the moment. So very interesting. Um, just to get into like, sort of the closing questions, they how like, and I, and I always really, this is something I really like to understand about, about people, especially tech leaders who are juggling so many things. Um, in terms of maximizing productivity, how do you sort of balance and manage your time as, as a tech leader? Like, do you have a, a morning routine, for example? Um, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm able to take a shower in the morning, uh, that's, uh, that's a good day because I have a <laughs> And uh, you know, I have a three-year-old and a six-month-old, and uh, yeah, it's like literally we're juggling kids to get things done. Um, and so, like, uh, yeah, like getting my son to daycare is, uh, I think, the proverbial challenge of every morning. So yeah, yeah, I think uh, I don't have quite a, a morning routine yet, um, but I think what I try to do to uh, manage my time and stay sane is to, um, I think, it use a combination of. Uh, of uh, Eisenhower Matrix and, and and Google Keep, where I um, basically you know if I if I need to do something I kind of prioritize it in terms of urgency and and importance and then I um, have different lists and so right. I try to keep myself focused on what's what's the most important and urgent things for me and then and then go from there. So I have you know so I have sort of a list for things I need to do today, things I need to do this week, things I need to do later on. Uh, things that are that are going to pop up on a regular basis, and I and I just sort of move through lists, uh, and that that's my way of uh, keeping things sane for myself. Yeah, um, I think I have a similar Eisenhower matrix sort of following where you you have like urgent, and then like you things you're going to schedule, and then things that aren't so urgent. Yeah, that, I think that's like one of the only things that actually works for me, to be fair. Um, and on the, on the, on the topics of advice, like what advice would you give for someone, let's say like they're a junior engineer or they're even looking to get into the tech industry. What's your sort of advice to someone starting out? Um, I mean, I think the, the most important thing I would say is don't be a code monkey. Um, like there's a lot to learn as a junior engineer when it comes to, um, being a software engineer, um, uh, I, I mean, there's a ton of things, especially depending on what you what specific engineering you're focused on, whether it's front end or back end engineering or system engineering. You know, there's just always just a ton of things to learn, and you, there's a lot of um, you know, there's a lot of imposter syndrome and a lot of uh, uh, low confidence. You have a lot of low confidence and and things like that. You have a lot of issues with that. Um, you know, it, it it's it's okay. To take time to learn. But also take time to uh, learn beyond that. So be open to understanding how the business works. Be under, open to understanding that there's more to life than, or more to what you do than just like the tech aspect. There's also a, an entire business that's that's running around it. And uh, um, you know, don't don't be a cook monkey. Like you know, don't just sit there waiting for things to be handed to you. You know, be curious. Um, really 
and try to understand what's happening around you. Try to understand the, the business that you're in. Um, and, because I think, you know, if you're actively engaged um, and you really care about the business that you're in and you learn the business, the language of the business that you're in, uh, that makes you much more valuable. Um, and it makes you a much more whole, a, a much more whole as a person. And it makes you much more valuable as a software engineer because, you know, you know, anyone can be taught how to, you know, to write unit tests or, you know, anyone can be taught how to write HTML, but like to really uh, understand and care and be engaged in what the business is doing and what everyone in, in that business is doing, that's, that's something you can't teach. That's something um, that you, you know, you can nurture and you can hope that, that, it, that, that, that happens and that, 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 that grows. But uh um, you know, I think that's the thing that really makes you or sets you apart from everyone else is your 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 willingness to care, your willingness to to um, you know l learn the 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 language of the business and really um, extend yourself beyond the team. Really interesting, really good knowledge. Um, I guess it goes, yeah. I mean, don't be a code monkey, <laughs> like you were saying earlier. Um, make sure you don't, no, don't just wear like one hat, right? Wear multiple hats sort of in, in the roles and understand, and, and not just, you know, uh, non-tech people trying to understand tech, but also tech people trying to understand like what, what, what we're selling here, what's the, what's the mission from operations perspective, how do we engage with partners, things like this. It's, yeah, that's really great advice. Talking about um, technology as well, what's, what's your favorite three book recommendations you think you have for, for technology? Um, so there are a lot of books that I could recommend. Um, so it's hard. It's it's this is really hard. I I don't. I, don't, I, I, I it's hard to uh, choose just three. I'll I'll. I'll Everyone does this. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure I'm not the only one. Uh, I'll I'll talk about the three that I like the most. That I enjoy the reading the most because they did just. There's like this light bulb moment in my head uh, when I read them that that was like really cool and exciting for me. Mm. Uh, the first one was Managing Humans um, by Michael Lopp. Uh, I really like that book because um, he tells it from his own perspective and his own mistakes. And he made a lot of mistakes. Uh, and and the, the candor that he uses and, and the way he talks about um, uh, the, the business of being a, t a tech leader, um, it, you know, it's, it, he really talks of it, talks about it from a human perspective of, you know, like, you know, there's a lot of emotion and, you know, there's like, you know, you, you know, it's, it's pretty natural to hit your manager, you know, or, or, or to think this one is, you know, full of it, uh, you know, and, 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 and that's a natural part of working in a company or just working anywhere that's that, you know, people don't like each other or people, you know, uh, or, or people do like each other and you have to. I think you have to think about that from a psychology standpoint, uh, going, going back to motivations, you know, it, it's never, it's not so cut and dry. It's not like you do X and, and then get Y output. Uh, mm -hmm. with people, you get, you put an X and then you get, uh, you know, you get A and you, get, you never expected or would have predicted A. Um, so I think he talks about that and, and his experiences about that. And I think that's really quite, quite uh, illuminating. Uh, the second one uh, was is the the goal by like Goldratt. Um, I really enjoyed it. It's, so it's it, it's told from a narrative point of view. So he he um, he actually tells a story about this about uh, about this uh, manager who's you know his factory is is going to be shut down because you know uh, because of a diff difficult market situations etc. And uh, he actually finds a way out of that. Um, and by actually kind of looking at his own company and how it works in a in, in a in a completely do what new way and so i mean a, a lot of it goes to um theory of constraints and and how to look at how like you know things are put together and how uh you know how like uh dependencies uh, affect uh, how things are work because nothing kind of i mean n nothing is built in and of itself there's always dependencies there's always like i i need this for this thing and this for that thing there's always a supply chain that happens and uh, he talks about that and how how like there's a sort of net effect of all of that and how you could actually gain a lot by doing uh, some very say anti um, what's what I'm looking for unintuitive things uh, to 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 make things work. So really kind of illuminating book as well. Um, and the last one is the Switch by Chip Heath. Uh, uh, I really love this book because uh, so this book is about change and change management and how to create change when change is hard. 
And uh, the reason I like this book is because um, he, he goes into different stories at different companies. He talks about different stories in different companies uh, where um, someone was able to make change when, when, when uh, uh, there was a history of resistance to change um, and how, how um, they were able to do that. And there's this underlying theory about the writer and the elephant. There's this underlying theory about um, the writer and the elephant where you know the writer is this um uh is the sort of rational part of your of people's brains and then the elephant is sort of the irrational and so uh uh and uh, so you, ha you you know oftentimes it, you know we're talking to the rational part of people's brains but the irrational part is actually going in a completely different direction so maybe you've, mm -hmm. you know and you know if you think about it in in, in sales uh uh, even in advertising, you know, a lot of modern advertising is about appealing to the the you know the proverbial elephant. It's not about like making a case for your for like a logical and rational case for your product. It's about associating your product with something really good or really aspirational. And when you do that, like the sort of the 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 sort of emotional or the the elephant side of our brain gets attracted to that and sort of pushes you in that direction. And I, and I think that's. Uh, that's a really interesting uh, way of looking at human behavior and, and how to um, make uh, convincing arguments of people when, when, you know, sometimes that's really hard. So three, three, those are the three book recommendations uh, that I could come up with. Yeah. Nice. I mean, that's probably the, one of the best answers we, we've had uh, for sure. Uh, the managing humans sounds really interesting. I always like this question because, well, I don't think my bank account likes the question much because I always <laughs> end up buying three books afterwards, but <laughs> But managing humans sounds really cool. So does the switch. I really like that. I haven't have not heard of that before. Uh, yeah. So thank you for those. Now, um, on a, on a more personal side of things, what about like the, for your favorite food? You mentioned uh, the the food in a, in America. Maybe maybe you could tell us your favorite food in Berlin, and then maybe your favorite food like back in the states as well. Oh, favorite food in Berlin. That's really hard. Um, yeah. I, it's maybe if you have like a go-to spot as well, like a restaurant. Um, you know, every time we do, it it shuts down. Like that's been <laughs> last few years. Like every, every like our, our favorite shut spot that for like a couple of year, like years, like all of a sudden disappears. Um, we really liked it. There's this place called Wen Chang that we really like. It's a nice noodle shop. Um, um, we really like uh, like there's there's a place called Standard uh for pizza. Uh, but I, like I said, nothing compares to Chicago, New York. Um, like, like personally, I, I'm, I love burgers. Like I'm a big uh, fan of, uh, of burgers. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, like funnily enough, um, I was really sad in Berlin until uh, a five guys opened up in Berlin. And if you don't know five guys, it's a, uh, it's a burger chain from the U S um, and, and that, that really, uh, so uh, I was finally able to have a good burger after that. <laughs> nice one. And um, yeah, I'm going to Berlin next week, so I'll definitely be checking it out. Um, what about your favorite uh, sort of drink? What's your favorite thing to drink? Uh, Berliner Luft? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I don't know, what, what is it? I, I don't, I'm not sure what a Berlin drink is. Like, a, I, I, I mean, I usually see the, the usual, like, Mojito Caipirinha, Apatol Spritz is really popular here in Berlin, but I don't, I don't see no. the, I don't see the the attraction. I don't know. I, I'm not a big Berlin drink, whatever that is. I'm, I, I'm, I probably, I'm not a big fan of it. <laughs> and um, maybe the next question would be like around, um, and your answer can't be the United States. Uh, <laughs> what's your, what your favorite country to to visit and why? Um. Probably Japan. My wife and I visited Japan for the first time just before the pandemic, so in 2019, and uh, we just really loved it. Like we just loved the the food, the culture. Um, uh, I mean, I, I don't think I've had ramen as as good as it, as in Tokyo, um, and I think just there's like a kind of spirit in the the people that we really that really appreciate. Like there's. Um, you know, there's, there's like a, a kind of gratitude in, in their daily mm -hmm. interactions that you don't see anywhere else. Like they, they, uh, um, you know, I think it was funny. I think someone once told me that like, that, um, uh, you know, that, you know, they, they're married to a Japanese, um, 
partner and uh, um, whenever he would talk on the phone you know he was born and raised in, in japan whenever he talk on the phone he would bow on the phone uh and, and you know it's just like that's just part like it's just so ingrained in their culture that they they that they that even on the phone they bow like that's it's just uh and I, I think there's something really sweet about that no it's lovely I, I'd, lo I'd love to go to japan i mean it's a so far far way uh it's probably an expensive flight as well but i'm sure I'm sure it's definitely worth it and then my yeah. final question then how um, what's your sort of feedback on on this podcast uh i, I mean I mean, it's, it's been a great conversation. I really, I really enjoyed this. Um, I, uh, I, I really enjoyed talking about the the topics that are that are near and dear to me. Um, and and I, you've been you've been a, a lovely uh, uh, interviewer as well. So thank you for 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 uh, for this. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for for joining us. Is there is there any like um, things that you want to plug? Like uh, like do you have like a website or or uh, a blog or anything like this? I um I don't have I that's one of the things I've been meaning to do is uh is create a blog um right now I have a, a blog that's empty um but my website is nehalium dot com n e h a l i u m dot com um so I I sometimes I po post stuff there right now it's just like a bunch of links to my my CV and 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 a few other things um but eventually I'll have a blog um up there blog dot nehalium dot com that that uh, will have more of my my thoughts and musings but. I've been honestly with two kids. I've been too busy to do much else. Absolutely, and I've really enjoyed the conversation today. By the way, and um, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today for my sixth episode of Source Talks, the Tech Lab. I'd like to thank Niha for joining us. It's been really intriguing uh, listening to his story and his journey so far, from you know his tech upbringing to some of the biases he's encountered in tech and deconstructing some of those stereotypes. Um, and even learning more about, you know, his own core values and some of his personal interests as well. Um, really enjoyed the discussion today and thank you so much for having us. If you wanted to tune in to any of the other episodes, you can check out our website at www.source-technology.com. You can listen on all other major streaming platforms as well. So Spotify, YouTube, LinkedIn, we have our own personal website as well. If you're interested in joining our community, or sharing your insights or your your own stories and different business contexts or you know just generally being involved in the conversation and letting people learn more about yourself or your company just please reach out to me and we can book in a call and you can join our growing community we'd love to share and have more conversations like this so we can take ourselves to the next level thank you so much for tuning in i've been gus your host um, and i'll see you next time